بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته A group of men came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه آله وسلم came to Medina and fell sick they accepted Islam but they had this starving and hunger in them before they came and they fell sick because of the fever that was in common in Medina they requested the Prophet والسلام, for assistance so he told them to go out of Medina where the camels of sadaqah of charity is there stay there and he instructed them to drink from the milk and the urine of the camels. You did not hear that wrong. Yeah. He instructed them to drink from the milk and the urine of camels. One would say, urine of camels? What is this? Well, nowadays, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, it is scientifically proven from the States and from Europe that the urine of camels cures a lot of diseases and even if it was not proven we believe in this because our Prophet وسلم, instructed them to do this he did not instruct us to do anything with the urine of, cow, of cows or sheep but specifically only camels a question comes and, say, and, and this question is, is logical is the urine of camels najis, impure, or is it tahir, pure? The answer, of course, as long as they were instructed to drink it, it means that it is pure. Because it is well-known fact in Islam that you may not treat yourself, you may not, not consume anything as medicine as long as it's forbidden or as long as it is impure, najis. So they went. And before they knew it, they were well and healthy again. They did not thank and praise the blessing of Allah. They were not grateful to the kindness of the Prophet ﷺ. Instead, they went to the man who was taking care of the camels and they tortured him before killing him. And they ran away with some of the camels of the Prophet ﷺ. Once the Prophet came to know about this, he sent behind them Kurz ibn Jabir al-Fihri to go and salvage the camels and to get them back to justice. They were from the tribes of Ukl and Urayna and their story is known as the story of the Uraniyin and they were brought to justice. The Prophet ﷺ was very angry with them. So he ordered his companions to heat nails of iron and to do to their eyes what they did to that man whom they had tortured and killed. And he ordered their hands and legs to be chopped off and they were thrown on the open uh, 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 volcanic rocks the hot black rocks to, to uh, bleed till death and he left them to die. Some narrations say that he, they, he crucified two of them and did uh, uh, the things with the eyes to two and he, uh, to the other two he chopped off their hands and legs. Scholars say that this was before the Prophet ﷺ was ordered not to mutilate people. And the only reason that the Prophet did this والسلام, that it is exactly the same thing they did to that shepherd who was taking care of the camels. So in Islam, if someone harms you or oppresses you, you may treat him in the same fashion and manner. And that is why there was a report that a slave woman was killed by a Jew and 
the Jew smacked her head with two stones. And just as she was dying, the Prophet ﷺ came to her and told her, did so-and-so kill you? She said, no. She just moved her head. He named another man. She moved her head saying, no, it was not him. He named the Jew and she nodded her head saying, yes, he's the one. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed the companions to kill the Jew in the same fashion that he killed that woman by smacking his head between two big stones. So one would say, uh, why does not Islam forgive people if, if, if they did such a thing? Why do you have to retaliate? Because if Islam came with forgiving, this does not fit everyone. And this would encourage people to do more and more killing and looting. Imagine, if someone did this to your sister, and Islam tells you, forgive, would you forgive? No. Okay, if someone rapes another's, another one's daughter, and we tell him, okay, come on, it's a mistake, he's young, he's only 16, he's only 17, uh, he was under the influence of drugs, let him go. Do you think if you see him walking on the street, he would let him go? No. So Islam does not want chaos to be the rule. He wants the society to be governed and protected. And the only way to do this is to have the rule of law upon all. It's like setting an example for people to, to fear. Well, it's not only fear, it's justice. Yeah. Because if you want them to be afraid, instead of uh, chopping the hand of a person who steals, you could kill him, you could mutilate him, you could crucify him. This would make them more fearful. But Islam is the religion of justice. It tells you, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And if you look at the prisons in the West, and look at the prisons in countries that practice Islam and, and, and has Islam ruling her, her uh, judicial uh, um, courts. and courts and so on, you would find that there is no comparison, none whatsoever. In the United States of America, I think that was in 2003 or 2002, not less than 2,000 women are being raped every single day. And this is in accordance to the Department of Justice. You can visit their website, don't quote me. Just Google it, website to the Department of Justice and look at the timetable, they, uh, at the table they have for the rates of rape that were announced in the United States of America alone. Imagine this. And what usually, and, and I'm not talking about the things that were not reported, what happens if a person does such a crime? He would probably get a very strong court, uh, 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 um, trial. The victim would be scrutinized and intimidated in so many different ways by, the, by his lawyers. And then if indicted, then he would be sentenced to two years, three years in prison. With good behavior, probably he would be on the streets after nine months or one year. And this tells you he would go on and on and on doing his crimes because he's not afraid of anything. In Islam, chop his head off. End of story. So before you think on doing such a thing, you think more than twice. Because you know that it's not, it's not a game. It's not it's something easy for you to go. Sheikh, in the battlefield, <clears throat> we know that we are not allowed to kill children, women, and stuff like that. What if that happened from the Jews or from the, our enemy, if they kill our women and children, are we allowed to do the same? No. Again, it is forbidden in Islam to punish someone who is innocent for the wrongdoing of someone else. So, if someone kills my son, it is not lawful for me to go and kill his. He's the one who did the crime. He's the one to be Punished. Killed and punished for that. His son has nothing, uh, he has n not done anything wrong. So, completely in Islam, it's forbidden to punish someone for the wrongdoing of someone else. 
So no. the, the only the only thing we have to fight is the the the, uh, the warriors only. The warriors, yes, yeah, only. only those who are fighting us, we are allowed to fight, yeah. and that is why when the Prophet sallallahu as mentioned before, sent his companions to kill Abu Rafi' ibn uh, uh, Abi Haqiq, the Jew. Uh, uh, and, and, and so many others, he always told them, do not kill any child or any woman. Only those who are you going to kill who inflicted so much harm on the Muslims and wanted uh, to attack the Muslim and collaborated in attacking and undermining the efforts of Islam. But to kill a, 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 a child or a woman, uh, to kill an elder, elderly or a priest or a monk, this is unacceptable. In Islam. So the Prophet, ﷺ, because of their wrongdoing, he instructed the, the companions to do such severe punishment on them. The scholars say this was at the very beginning, but then the Prophet ﷺ was given the uh, uh, ayah, the verse of Hiraba, of those who spread mayhem in, 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 in the land and intimidate and terrorize people. He is given the choice of either killing them, crucifying them, chopping their hands and, and, and arms from uh, uh, opposite directions, or uh, uh, he has the fourth choice, which is to uh, uh, set them to exile or imprison them. And after that, the Prophet ﷺ did not do any uh, uh, similar uh, uh, mutilation. Well, actually, before that, he didn't even yeah, he do anything that was even close to this. This was the only time because of what they had done with that man. Again, before, it was okay and permissible for the Prophet ﷺ to burn people to death. And this may, may have happened once or twice. And then Allah instructed him that this is completely unacceptable. And no one punishes with fire except the Lord of the fire, who is Allah, the Almighty. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned. Inshallah, we will be right back. So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and his mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. One night, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a dream. And we know that the dreams of the messengers of Allah are prophecies. They are not only dreams because dreams that are fabrications are the result of Satan and they don't get Satan to influence them. So the Prophet wasallam saw in his dream that he was wearing the ihram and it's the garment that a, a person who intends to perform umrah or to perform pilgrimage must wear. So he saw that he is he was wearing the ihram and that he went to Mecca to perform umrah and that he had the keys of the Kaaba, the holy Kaaba. And he told his companions about this, and they were very happy. They were very joyful, simply because it's been almost six years since they've seen the Kaaba. And you can imagine the, 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 the feeling they had. They were homesick after spending all your youth, all your life, born, raised in Mecca, where you can go to the holy mosque and go around the holy Kaaba in tawaf 
pray to the Holy Kaaba and see the holy shrines of the Haram and all of a sudden you had to migrate and leave your homeland to a new country so you can imagine the feelings, the feelings they had once they heard this so the Prophet Sallallahu gathered those who were with him and about 1400 men went to Mecca for Umrah now it was obvious that the Prophet Sallallahu did not go to Mecca to invade it because he had very light arms with him they had only their swords they did not come in armor on the contrary they came wearing the garments of Ihram and also they had the camels with them that were to be sacrificed in Mecca and these camels usually are driven by those performing pilgrimage or Umrah and they were known to be for sacrifice so no one would use them and it would be honored and the minute you see such a, a, a caravan you would know that this is a holy caravan headed for pilgrimage or for Umrah they had few marks or uh, uh, things indicating signs indicating that these are for sacrifice and the Prophet ﷺ went heading to Mecca. Mecca all around Arabia the word was the people of Quraysh do not prevent anyone from coming to the holy mosque to the Kaaba because this is the house of Allah so we have no right to prevent anyone from coming in now the Prophet went alayhi salatu wasalam and the people of Quraysh heard about this and they were outraged not because the Prophet is coming to perform Umrah but because the Prophet sallallahu is coming and they thought that over their dead body they would not accept this and that was very strange because this is the house of Allah who are you to prevent him from coming and worshipping he's not coming to stay he is coming to worship the Almighty again their arrogance prevented them from seeing the truth so they sent Khalid ibn al-Walid one of their great warriors and fighters and leaders in a detachment of 200 riders they wanted to intercept the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet heard of him coming so he went out of the normal road he took right and went up west and went through a very narrow and hard trail it was very difficult but still the Prophet Sallallahu went there because he wanted to avoid fighting he, did, he is not there to fight though he could have easily fought Khalid and the men with him and killed them all but he was on a holy trip he was not there to fight and when he reached an area called Al Hudaybiyah the camel sat and stopped Hudaybiyah is clo close to what we know now in present days as a Shemesi it's a checkpoint if you're going from Jeddah to Mecca it's the checkpoint there this area is called Hudaybiyah so the camel sat and refused to continue so the companions started pulling the uh, 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 camels. the camels and as you can see on the map this was the route where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and, 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 and these are the different areas of course to the west is the Red Sea so Mecca is not that far from the Red Sea it's about 100 kilometers uh, to the east of it and this is where it all took place now the Prophet ﷺ told his companions that let go of my camel and they were trying to make the camel stand and move and they t he told him that let go of it Th it was prevented 
from moving by the same person or by the same power that prevented the elephant from attacking Mecca. And as you recall, yeah, yeah. that uh, uh, the people of Yemen wanted to destroy the oh, Kaaba okay. on the year that the Prophet ﷺ was born, known as the year of the elephant. And they sent all their soldiers and their elephants to attack the Kaaba and destroy it because they had a church in Yemen. And some Arab went in there and he uh, 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 put filth into it because they wanted that church, that big uh, uh, monument to replace the Kaaba where people would come and perform pilgrimage instead of going to Kaaba. So the king of that country got furious and he wanted to attack the Kaaba and destroy it. And you know the story, uh, as we it was mentioned before, where Allah Azza wa Jal sent these birds and they were all killed and attacked. So the Prophet is telling them that Allah, who prevented the elephant from proceeding forward, had made my camel stop here, so we will stop and set camp. And by Allah, whatever treaty and agreement they ask of me in order to glorify the holy shrines, I will accept. So the Prophet ﷺ had an idea of things that will progress in a, in a certain fashion. Once the Prophet ﷺ reached that stage, they, sat, uh, they had their camp near a well, but unfortunately, the well ran out of water. So the enemy, the, the people of Quraysh and uh, the Ahabish army, was closer to the wells that had all the water. And the Prophet ﷺ had only one well, and it was out of water. So the companions of the Prophet ﷺ complained that, we have a problem, we don't have water. One narration says that he took an arrow from his back and he asked them to throw it in the well. Another narration says that he himself spit in that well. And subhanallah, all of this is authentic. The well was flooded with water and they drank and they filled their uh, uh, water uh, uh, bags or water containers and they washed and they did whatever they wanted with so much water that was more than what they needed and this again was a miracle from Allah to his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along so many miracles Badil ibn Warqa al-Khuzai came in a group of his tribesmen as we know he is from the tribe of Khuza'a. That's why he's called Al-Khuza'i. So they usually make the last name referring to tribe, the, tribe. the tribe. So he came to the Prophet wasalam, and he told, them, told him that, you know that I'm your ally. But I'm telling you, Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay and his people, the all the people of Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay with the Ahabish, came next to the water wells of Hudaybiyah. And they brought with them their wives and children. Why would anyone do that? What do you think? For war. For, for war, but why do you bring your wives and children? For all Maybe to encourage them. Yes, Fine. it's not to encourage them. It's to show oh. them that this, there's no going back. Yeah. If you lose, they will enslave your children and wives. So, fight till the death. So, this meant that they were really serious. They came with their wives and children to say that we're going to die before allowing you to come uh, uh, to Mecca. So, the Prophet ﷺ told him that we didn't come or I didn't come to fight anybody. I just came to perform Umrah. And... It's very strange. The people of Quraysh are weakened by so many fights. They are weakened, but we are stronger. The people of Quraysh are weakened by the fights. So why not put a time limit between the both of us? Why not have a truce? And if Allah Azza wa Jal 
makes me prevail over the people, then they have the choice whether to join me and accept Islam and be part of this victory or to reject it. And this, is, this sounds acceptable. What's wrong with you, the people of Quraysh? And he told them, he told Badil, uh, Badil ibn Warqa, this is a choice. They could have a truce and await until things materialize. If I'm victorious, they can join me if they want. But if they don't want to have a truce and they decide to fight me and to prevent me from entering Mecca, by Allah, I will fight them till the death, until my head falls and, and, and it's not on my body. So, Budayl ibn Warqa went to the people of Mecca and he told them all of this and he told them that he is asking you for a very well and sound plan you should accept. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.